Hello, and welcome to our Kitty University's histology course lecture on the circulatory system. In part one of this lecture, we're going to take a look at general characteristics associated with the circulatory system. As with all of these lectures, please review the objectives uh, that are listed uh, to help you determine what are the important concepts that are being covered in the series of lectures, as well as it provides you with an opportunity to use these as study focusing questions if you're interested. If we take a look at the basic uh, functions of the circulatory system, we're going to focus in the cardiovascular system first, uh, and then later on uh, talk about the lymphatic uh, circulatory system. But in general, what we're talking about with the circulatory system uh, in general and the cardiovascular system a little bit more specifically is a mechanism of transport and distribution of materials within the body. And so it's you know, almost like a little freight train on the, uh, the diagram of the, the right-hand side of the slide. But essentially what we're going to be doing with the cardiovascular system is transporting materials back and forth throughout the body. And so basically it's going to be transporting it uh, from a location where it's going to be obtained or brought in or created or processed and deliver it to where it's needed. And then at the same time, pick up the waste materials out where it's being used and transport them, the waste materials, to some location in the body where they can be filtered out and removed. And so what we're looking at with the cardiovascular system is going to be the transport of things like oxygen. Uh, we talked about the respiratory system in the previous lecture. Uh, but as well as waste materials, uh, we're going to talk later on about the digestive system. So we'll talk about how we can bring nutrients into the body and distribute them. Uh, take a look at body fluids and solutes. Uh, could be things like ions, could be just the, the simple water uh, that's being transported through the body. But it also is going to be transporting things like body heat. And so essentially carrying um, the body heat, the body essentially regulating the body temperature by where the blood flow is going to be going. Uh, and then finally, it, it's going to be involved with transporting specialized cells, primarily immune system cells, uh, throughout the body to where they need to be uh, in order to either uh, essentially assess what's going on in the body, determine whether there's, there's foreign materials or potential pathogens, disease-causing uh, structures that could be in the body, as well as delivering these immune system cells or antibodies to the location where they're needed to be able to fight off some type of uh, foreign infection or foreign invasion of a pathogenic source. But primarily, what we're going to be looking at is, regardless of what materials we're transporting within the cardiovascular system, we're essentially going to be transporting it within a fluid matrix. And so, start out with, take a look at the, the body just the distribution of body fluids within kind of a generic uh, individual. Roughly about 40 liters uh, of fluid within an individual, a 70 kilogram male is the, the textbook explanation, so about 57% of the body weight is going to be fluid. Now, over half of this is going to be intracellular. It's going to be found within our cells. And so we've talked about the properties of cell biology earlier uh, within the course. We're going to reinforce it pretty much in every lecture as we go forward. But each cell has its cytoplasm, has an aqueous uh, kind of collection of materials within it that keep it alive. And then outside of that, extra cellular, we're going to have about 15 liters of fluid. And if we look at the distribution of these fluids outside of the cell, we're going to see that interstitial fluids, kind of the, what you can think about as the tissue fluid, the fluid that's in the space around the cells, in essence, and in the connective tissue and kind of distributed throughout the body, is going to be about nine liters. Lymph, which we'll talk about at the last lecture of this, this series on the circulatory system. Lymph is excess tissue fluid that has been uh, essentially collected by a second circulatory system. It's going to be a lymphatic circulatory system. And it's involved with returning the fluid and the materials that are within that fluid back through the body through a series of filters, which we'll talk about in the next lecture on lymph nodes, uh, but return those fluids back to the cardiovascular system where they can be recycled throughout the body. And then finally, we're going to talk about plasma. Plasma is actually that fluid which is within the cardiovascular system. And so that's going to be the focus of what we're talking about within this, primarily the focus within this series of lectures. So if we take a look at the cardiovascular system, again, looking at general generalizations, uh, what we're looking at is going to be a closed circulatory system. Uh, so it's essentially comparable to a system 
of plumbing. And so ideally, we're going to have a pump at one location, and the pump is going to be the heart, and it's going to be pumping, and it's going to be propelling the fluid, in this case the blood, through a series of vessels. And then ultimately, it's going to go out through these vessels, it's going to stay within the vessels, it's going to do what it needs to do, and then ultimately return back to the pump, return back to the heart, so that it can be recirculated through the system another time. So if we take a look at this, similar to what we saw with the respiratory system, the cardiovascular system is involved with both transport, kind of bulk flow, bulk rapid transport of blood and the materials within the blood, as well as exchange. And so if we take a look at this, again, at the kind of gross level, the anatomical level, we can see that the transport portions of the cardiovascular system are going to be the heart. We have that muscular pump, which is going to be propelling the fluids through the system. We're going to hear a, a series of tubes or pipes. Uh, they're going to be the arteries, which are going to be carrying blood away from the heart towards the tissues where the materials are going to be uh, used. Or we're going to have veins, which are going to be a series of tubes, a series of pipes, a series of vessels, which are going to return the blood from the tissues back to the heart. And so these are going to be the transport mechanisms. We're also going to have an exchange process, an exchange uh, region of this circulatory system, the cardiovascular system. And the exchange portion is going to be the capillaries. And so this is almost like a, a little radiator or kind of a, a fine network of vessels, which are going to be out in the periphery, out in the body, uh, that are going to join between the arteries and the veins. And so it's going to be these capillaries where we're going to have almost like a radiator, if you want to think about it like that, is where the exchange is going to be occurring. We're going to branch out, have a lot of surface area available for diffusion to occur, and we're going to deliver the materials we've got in a close proximity, close location, to where they're going to be needed by the cells, again, to allow diffusion to work. If we look at the walls of a generic blood vessel, what we're going to see is there are going to be three concentric layers that are going to be the, the classic definition of what's within uh, a blood vessel. Now, it's important to recognize that sometimes the, the structures will be larger, sometimes they'll be smaller, sometimes they may be even absent. But we can take a look at this as a generalization. And so we're going to have the lumen, the space within uh, the blood vessel, the, the inside of the, the, the pipe or inside of the tube, and that's going to be one on this diagram that we're looking at on the right-hand side of the slide. Inside of that, we're going to have the tunica intima, kind of the layer that's kind of intimate up against the lumen. And so what that is going to be is going to be a simple squamous uh, epithelium. It's going to be referred to as the endothelium. We'll talk about this in more detail over the next couple slides. But we've got this inner layer. The next layer is going to be the tunica media. And that's the kind of reddish and uh, kind of grayish uh, layer. Uh, where the numbers two, three, and four are sitting is the tunica media. Uh, I don't see an arrow that's really pointing to it uh, on this diagram, but that's going to be the smooth muscle layer. And so we're going to have smooth muscle wrapped circumferentially. So the long axis of those spindle shaped cells is going to be wrapped around the lumen of the blood vessel. And then outside of that, we're going to have the tunica adventitia. And the tunica adventitia isn't really that clear on this slide, uh, but it's kind of that greenish material that's to the very edges of this image. And that's going to be, again, the connective tissue component of the wall of this blood vessel. So again, taking a look at this, we've got three concentric layers. So we've got the lumen, we've got the space within the tube, and this is where we're going to, blood is going to be transported, the cells, all of those materials are going to be passing through this tube. And what we want to have is going to be a nice, smooth lining of the tube, nice, smooth lining of our blood vessel, so that things are able to move through the vessel very, very rapidly without sticking, without being uh, disrupted in any way. And so the tunica intima is going to be that innermost layer, the layer that's closest to the lumen, closest to the space in the inside of our vessel. And the tunica intima is going to be composed of an endothelium. And the endothelium is just a specialized term that we're going to give for the simple squamous epithelium of a blood vessel. And so these are going to be very flat cells uh, a nice smooth surface along the inside of our blood vessel. It's going to be like all epithelium sitting upon a basement membrane and then below that we're going to have a subendothelial or loose connective tissue. And again keep in mind that it's this loose connective tissue that supports the endothelium because we're not going to have 
uh, essentially blood vessels or anything going up into the endothelium itself. The next layer is going to be the tunica media. And the tunica media, again, keep in mind, is going to be circumferentially oriented vascular smooth muscle. And so if we take a look at the diagram on the right hand side, you can see that these spindle shaped smooth muscle cells are wrapped around the lumen. And so it's almost as if you, you take your hands and kind of make a big circle with your hands and your fingers coming together and you look through that circle and then you've got these smooth muscle cells through the kind of fingers coming together. The nice thing about this is that when the smooth muscle cells contract, they're essentially going to cause that lumen to be constricted down a little bit. They can regulate the diameter of the lumen. They can regulate the blood flow through the blood vessel by constricting or relaxing. And then outside of that, outside of the tunica media, that middle layer, we're going to have the tunica adventitia. And the tunica adventitia is going to be a dense, irregular connective tissue. Lots of type 1 collagen for strength, lots of elastic fibers so that it can expand and recoil without damage. But it's essentially going to give additional support to the blood vessel wall, as well as serving to anchor it into the surrounding tissues. If we take a look at blood vessel categories, and again, this is a little bit of a generalization, we're going to have elastic arteries like the aorta, which are going to be subject to very high pressure and very rapidly distributing blood to the body. Uh, so it's essentially coming off of the heart. We're going to have muscular arteries, which are going to be distributing blood to the organs. So these are going to be like the named arteries if you were to take an anatomy course. Uh, arterioles are going to be a smaller artery. Then they're going to be involved with controlling blood pressure and uh, the volume into the capillaries. So they're essentially going to regulate the blood flow into the capillaries. Capillaries, we said, are going to be the exchange structure. So the exchange of molecular materials. And then at the opposite end of the system, we're going to have venules, which are going to be retrieving the blood, uh, recovering the blood, uh, receiving the blood from the capillaries. And in a category of these venules, we're actually going to have exchange of cells, a process of diapedesis where uh, white blood cells are going to move from the bloodstream into the surrounding tissues. And then veins, which are going to be running parallel in the opposite direction, though, uh, to the arteries, which are going to be collecting, storing, and ultimately returning the blood to the heart where it can be circulated through the body again. Now, if we take a look at the properties associated with this, and this, there's a lot going on in this slide, but if we take a look at it, <clears throat> in essence, the things to keep in mind, take a look at the bottom uh, image on this, this slide, the heart is going to be very forcibly pumping blood into the system. And so when the heart contracts, we're going to put a lot of pressure on the blood and push the blood out into the elastic arteries and the aorta. When it relaxes, when it recoils, that blood pressure is going to drop. But we're going to have enough pressure at the start of the system so that we can push the blood all the way through the arteries, through the capillaries, through the veins, and back to the heart again. And so what we're going to see is that we've got a continuous decrease in the blood pressure as we're going through these systems with uh, the veins and the vena cava, the return mechanism within the heart, uh, the major vein of returning to the heart, is going to be at the lowest level. If we take a look at surface area on the top of this diagram, we're going to see that we're going to be rare, have a relatively low surface area because we're doing bulk flow through the aorta, through the arteries, even in the veins and the venules, uh, a little bit, but into the veins so that the highest surface area is going to be the capillaries. The highest surface area is going to be where we're going to have that exchange occurring. And going along with that, we're going to see that the blood is going to slow down within these capillaries, again, to allow diffusion to occur. And this is mainly because we're not doing bulk flow at this point. We're basically lining up our little red blood cells so they're passing single file through these blood vessels within the capillaries within the aorta, within the arteries, within the veins, we've got lots of blood cells kind of packed within the same region, all moving in a bulk flow method all together. Okay, and this is going to end our lecture on the generalizations associated with uh, the cardiovascular system, the circulatory system. As always, if you have any questions, be free to email me at hoffmanj at arcadia.edu, and please come back for part two of the cardiovascular system lectures. Thanks.